for everybody out there. We're looking, we're looking at power in prayer and hope everybody's okay. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just come before you today and Lord, we confess all our sins and all our failures today. And so, Father, we praise you and thank you for this day. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. And, Father, we pray that you would be in these messages today in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at power in prayer. It's two messages, so it's going to be um, maybe 80 minutes to two hours uh, long. Um, so it's going to be quite in-depth. Uh, I did it. I tried to do it about five days ago, and something happened. Um, if you go to just look around, find the video "Power on Prayer," "Power Power in Prayer Part One." You'll find a video around. And at the end of the video, you find that the atheists were just doing things to wind me up and spoil that time. And um, but I'm not going to be put off. I want to teach the Bible, so from time to time, I will do. And um, I want to finish this power in prayer. I'm going to do it again and go right through. And there are two messages um, for this. So it's going to be in-depth Bible teaching. And I uh, hope that it's a blessing to you, really. So without further ado, if, if you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 13, 2 Chronicles chapter 13, and we'll re read from verse 1 to 7. Now, in the eighteenth year of King Jeroboam began Abijah reign over Judah. And he reigned three years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was also Micaiah, and daughter of Uriel Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. And Abijah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war, even four hundred thousand chosen men. And Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with eight hundred thousand chosen men being mighty men of valor. And Abijah stood up upon Mount Zeropin, which is Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, all hail, O Israel. Ought you not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over, over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and had rebelled against his Lord. And there are gathered unto him vain men, the children of Bilel, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tender-hearted and could not stand with them. Then we read in verse 10, But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests and the ministers unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites wait until their business. And then we read, But Jeroboam caused an ambush to come about behind them, so they were before Judah, and the ambush was behind them. And when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind, and they cried unto the Lord, and the priests had sound with trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout, and as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that the gods smote Jeroboam and all Judah before Abijah. And Judah. So that is the passage that that we're looking at today. And prayer is at the heart of the church life and of the Christian life. In Romans chapter twelve, verse one, we're commanded be faithful in prayer. One writer said, one of the best ways to get on your feet is to first get on your knees. And today we need to get on our knees. The church is in grave danger. The church is in grave danger and has many, many needs today. And we need to be praying. R.A. Torrey in 1912 says, we live in an age of hustle and bustle, of man's efforts and man's determination, of man's confidence in himself and in his own power to achieve things, a name of an aim, an age of human organization and human machinery and human push and human scheming and human achievement 
in the things of God, this means no real achievement at all, R.A. Tory. And the evangelical church today and the Lord's people are running around thinking they're clever with their own ingenuity, their own ability, their own ability to get church going with their new ideas about church, their new ideas about how to do ministry. But the tide is getting worse and worse in the nations, are getting more ungodlier. And just because we're clever and smart and can come up with ideas, and because and we're trendy, doesn't mean a thing. We need God to come and help us as a church. And so if you read 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 24, 25, we read these words. Or if your people Israel are defeated before, sorry, before an enemy because they have sinned against you, and return and confess your name, your name and pray to make supplication before before you in the temple then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back in the land which you gave to them and their fathers their scriptures are teaching that if we come to God and repent and ask God for forgiveness then God will bless his church if we pray and, and turn to God. In 2 Chronicles 32 verse 20, 23, now because of the, this king Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos prayed and cried out to heaven, then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor, leader and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned shamefaced to his own land, and when he had cut, gone in the temple, his God some of his own offspring struck him down with the sword there. The church is in grave danger. There are great challenges ahead and, and the church is not doing well at all. Not in the West. The church is struggling. The tide of ungodliness is, a, is, a, is, a whole, is at an all-time high. And the only way we can deal with it is not by apologetics, not by organization. The only way we can deal with it is by getting on our knees and praying and asking God to work. In 2 Chronicles chapter 34 verse 21, Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against his, his, this place and against its inhabitants and you humbled yourself before me and you tore your clo clothes and wept before me, I also have heard says the Lord. God will hear you and hear us as we turn to him in prayer. Now some people might say, well Jay, um, you know, it, all this praying and fighting in prayer, it's all extreme, let's just get on with our lives, everything's okay, people are okay, you're just being extreme. Well, in, in the passage that we were looking at, Abijah set the battle in order in verse 3, in the chapter that we're looking at. In uh, chapter 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 3. Sorry. 2 Chronicles um, chapter 13, verse 3. Abijah set the battle in order. He was in a battle, and there are many Christians today that don't realize they're in a battle. Do you realize the way the nation has gone, where you live, has, has become secular? Do you realize the tide of ungodliness? Uh, Christians are living in a bubble, a little middle-class bubble, where they've got the house and the car, and they're getting on with their lives, but they don't realize how desperate the situation is. So we're in the battle church history shows it. What about Charles Spurgeon? There a Baptist minister in the 19th century uh, found that many ministers were not preaching the doctrine of hell and taking on higher criticism. He sounded an alarm and they rejected him. His own denomination rejected his call because he said they were sliding into sin. And he, he had an early death, Charles Spurgeon, because he was rejected by his own colleagues. We're in a battle, and we need to wake up. Daniel chapter 3, 23, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. They were, the Jewish people 
were thrown into the fire by Nebuchadnezzar. And there is an enemy out to destroy the church. The devil, the world, is out to destroy the church. We are in a battle. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the West, we're in a battle. Now, Christians in, in the East are losing their lives. People are losing their life. In, in the Middle East, for example, in, in many uh, countries such as Egypt, etc., that Christians are losing their life for name in the name of Jesus. In the West, we don't lose our lives, but we have to realize we are in our battle. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10:4, the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God. So in the battle, we don't use the weapons of our enemies. We, we, we don't use the weapons of our enemies. We don't use bullets and bombs. We use prayer. We pray. Uh, persecution has gone on in Protestant house churches in, in Bhutan have been arrested. Uh, John Carlos Gonzalez Levu, a blind Christian human rights lawyer, was given a year sentence on the April 20, 28th um, a, a few years ago for his stand on human rights in Cuba. A 23-year-old Pakistani Christian has died of injuries uh, a few years ago and this is happening even today. And so we're in a battle and you can't sit back and pretend that we're not in a battle. And if we're in a battle we need to be praying. And so we lack power in prayer because we would rather live a nice life than engage in prayer. And so Lord Jones has said, spiritual life means conflict. Then the next kind of argument is, well, what will be, will be mentality. It, the, the tide of ungodliness is coming. It's going to be that way. Let's just leave it there. Let's just, just do it. Let, let's just, why are we getting worried about it? Don't bother it. What will be, will be. Imagine Winston Churchill when the Nazis invaded France and when they took the Jews and they were killing the Jews, millions of them, if Churchill would have said, well, the tide of the Nazis is coming, well, what will be, will be. He didn't. He got ready and he, he engaged for battle. And God hasn't changed. If we go to our passage in 2 Chronicles 13, verse 5, should you not know that the Lord God Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever to him and his sons by a covenant of salt? The people, the God doesn't change. So you might say, well, what will be, will be. Well, that God doesn't change. And God is a God of mission. He's a God, he's a God who's come to save souls. And that's our mission. Our mission is to preach the gospel. Our mission is to share the word of God to save souls. And God hasn't changed, so it doesn't matter how much opposition we get. It doesn't matter how tough the situation gets. Our calling is to preach the word of God and to teach the word of God. God doesn't change, so for you to say, oh, we can just sit back and relax. I'm sorry. God has said that we've got to go out and do mission. And he has promised to bless his people. God will bless his people. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and hear their land. God is a God of blessing and he, and, and he wants to bless his church in the midst of the conflict. And so God's going to bless his church. There's going to be millions of people getting saved around the world even though we're in the midst of conflict. Acts chapter 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily who were being saved. This was at a time in the book of Acts when the church was being persecuted, and yet God added to the church. And whenever the church has been persecuted, God blesses it. So God's going to bless us. As we engage in prayer and as we go forward in mission, God's going to bless our churches. He's going to bless our ministry. God hasn't changed. A. Torrey said, there were conversions every Sunday. Indeed, there were conversions in about, in about the church practically every day of the week. 
In other words, Tory in the 19th century was praying and God was blessing. And you hear today many people say, well, people are not interested in Christianity. They're not interested in, in God. They're, they're not going to come to know God, but God hasn't changed. God is still saving souls. God is still on the throne. God is still doing his work. And we have to be have faith in him and believe in him and trust him and pray that he will convert souls. And he hasn't changed and he will convert people. So don't fall into the trap of accepting the status quo of having an Oliver Twist syndrome. You know that Oliver Twist when he was when he came up to the guy for some food and he held his bowl out and said, "Please, sir, can I have some more?" But it was kind of like as if grudgingly, as if like he's not going to get any. We need to be bold and realize that God is a God of love. And wants to bless us. Now he did not do many mighty works in Matthew 13, 58. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Because of the unbelief of people, the Lord couldn't work. And we mustn't be an unbelief. Yes, the tide of Islam is growing. Yes, the tide of secularism is growing. But we mustn't be un in unbelief. God can do and will do great things. Richard Elaine, Elaine, the reason why we obtain no more in prayer is because we expect no more. God usually answers us according to our own hearts. Psalm 67 verse 7, God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. God has not changed and God will bless his people. Now, the other problem that many people have today is they'll turn around and they'll say, well, well, it's too big a problem. Uh, we, we can't do the job of mission. It's too, too big for us. The enemies are too big. Look at all the skeptics, how they uh, uh, are taking over. Look at all the Muslims, how they are taking over the West. It's too big for us. And so you're not being realistic, is the argument going. You you just got to realize it's too big. In verse 7, in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, he says, Then worthless robes gathered to him and strengthened themselves when Rehoboam was young and inexperienced and could not withstand them. I'll just check. Check that. <clears throat> it says in the King James, Now there are gathered unto him vain men, the children of Beli, and have strengthened themselves against Roboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tender-hearted and could not withstand them. If we talk like this, if we talk a defeatist attitude, just in, in the time of Rehoboam, we'll get men coming in who take over because we weren't strong. When the tide of ungodliness comes, if we just give in and, and say, well, they're too strong for us, then they will take over. We have to be strong. We have to, we're not fickle people. We are valiant men and women for God. Think of David. When the Philistines surrounded and came against the people of Israel and Saul was with his men and Goliath came forward he was, and Goliath was full of himself and, and proud and arrogant and David was just a shepherd boy and he was coming there to give to bring uh, some supplies for his brothers and, and Saul's army and he saw Goliath boasting and David was not having any of it and David went out and took on Goliath we have to have the David spirit we 
we have to be valiant for God. Doesn't matter how big the enemies of God are, we have to be stout. We have to be strong in the word, strong in Jesus. We have to be men and women of the gospel, my friend. No matter how strong the tide of, of the enemy comes against God or his people, no matter how strong that tide may be, you have to be strong in the word, strong for the gospel. Paul was in prison. And when he wrote to the Philippian church and he said, what did he say? We are set for the defense of the gospel. This man was in prison. This man, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, was a man who had been persecuted, who had been beaten, but he was unstoppable. And he preached the word of God. John Calvin at Geneva where they kicked him out and he came back. Oh, my friend, we could go on and on of Adonai Judson, the great missionary who went to Burma and was hung upside down by the authorities for a few years, and it was dreadful. John Nelson, who preached at Yorkshire and was arrested, and his wife went to see him. This is in the 1700s, and the wife goes to see him, and she's pregnant, and a crowd came out and beat her up. And she lost her baby, but they still preach the word of God. Uh, be valiant when Spurgeon was all on his own and stood against all the ministers in the Baptist Union and said, we are sliding, we are going down ill in the downgrain controversy. He stood strong. When Gresham Machen in the Presbyterian denomination in America in the 1920s said, we are going down ill. And the liberals put him on trial and said, you are upset in the church. But all he was doing is saying, no, we have to do mission. We have to preach the gospel to everybody. And the liberals were saying, no, you can get saved by Buddha. You can get saved by Muhammad. You can get saved by Jesus. And he was having none of it. No, no, no. We, we get saved by Jesus and we've got to do mission. So they put him on trial in his own denomination. And they kicked him out. Gresham Machen stood tall and strong. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in the 90s when the, the, the students in the universities in, in, in the UK were embattled because they felt Christianity was, was not up to, the, uh, up to standing against the intellectuals in the universities and felt beleaguered and battered. And Lloyd-Jones being a scientist but also being a preacher said to the students, stand tall, we can defend the faith. We can have answers for science. We can have answers for the Christian faith. And he stood tall and he introduced strong preaching, biblical preaching. But he also inspired a new generation of students to realize that Christianity is not anti-intellectual. And he started a, a, a group of scholars with F.F. F. Bruce and others. And they built scholarship where they wrote commentaries and books to inspire a new generation to show that the Christian faith is not anti-intellectual. But he preached powerful sermons at universities at Oxford. And he didn't compromise but preached a simple, clear gospel in the 1940s. And, ch and then we think of Francis Schaeffer in the 1960s when the hippie culture in Switzerland where he opened the brie. And there students all over the world would come and he would show them that the Christian faith can make sense in art and philosophy. And Jim Elliot, when he went to the 1950s over to South America to reach to the, the Orca Indians, and there he and his mates were killed just as they got off the plane. They were valiant for Jesus. And whatever is coming against you in our age, no matter how bad it is in our age, no matter how powerful Islam becomes, no matter how powerful Secularism comes. You be valiant for Jesus. For you come in a long, noble line of servants of God. Carry the torch as they carried the torch. When Napoleon rose up with his mighty army, the British did not stand still, but they went and they fought. When Hitler rose up with his mighty army, the British did not stand, but they went and fought. And when the armies of God, enemies of God come, we do not sit still. We stand and we fight. But we do not fight with bombs. We do not fight with knives. We do not fight with hate. We fight with love. We fight with prayer. 
we fight fight with the gospel we are saving men and women and boys and girls from hell that is where we're going we must not stand still we must not fear the enemy we must engage in battle and we engage in battle by prayer the strength of the enemy has never deterred God and his people in Judges chapter 7 verse 7 then the Lord said to, to Gideon by 300 men who lapped I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand let all the other people go every man to his place Gideon was coming against a mighty army and God reduced Gideon's army to 300 men and God smote the enemies of Gideon with 300 men God does not need many people all he needs is a handful of people and a handful of people in the hand of God can do mighty things for a nation what did God do for Germany in the Reformation one man Martin Luther gave his life to God and that monk began to preach and teach the Word of God and he began to challenge the Catholic Church because it had gone from the Word of God and as he did that he shook not only Germany but the whole of Europe one man under God you do not fear the enemy my friend but advance in prayer for God 1 Samuel 17 26 for who is this uncircumcised that he should defy the armies of the living God David did not back down from Goliath and then David said the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine we go in the name of God we go in the name of the Creator goes with us in battle and David says then all this assembly shall know that the Lord doesn't does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord and he will give it you into your hand so David prevailed over the Philistines with a sling and a stone my friend the battle is not yours the battle is the Lord's he sees how dark it's come he sees the enemies on the on the horizon in their strength mocking looking as if they are boasting that they have the victory the secularists are boasting that they have defeated Christianity in the West the Muslims are boasting that they are advancing in the West and God sees all the enemies around and sees the people of God beleaguered and he sees them outnumbered and weak and frail but then the people of God cry out to their God Lord help us and in the midst of eternity beyond the stars and beyond the universe our God hears the prayers of his people and with a mighty power God comes and scatters his enemies he has always done it and he'll do it today but you must pray 1 Kings 18 then Elijah said to the people I alone am left and the prophet of the Lord but Baal's prophets are 440 men verse 27 of 1 Kings 18 and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said cry aloud for he is good either he is meditating or he is busy or he is on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened Elijah took on the prophets of Baal took him on one man took him on and faced them down in the name of the living God verse 38 of 1 Kings 18 the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and as Elijah prayed 
the fire came <laughs> on the sacrifice. Power of God came and burnt the sacrifice in the midst of the enemies. And there is a fire coming. There is a fire coming. There is a fire coming, my friend. Fire in the church. The fire of the Holy Ghost is coming. At the time of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God came, it was tongues of fire as a symbol of the Holy Spirit coming. And the Spirit of God is going to come. He's going to burn through the church. Men and women are going to cry out to God and get right with him and weep for their sin and get right with him and then be passionate and go and preach the gospel valiantly for Jesus. The fire of God is coming. The Spirit of God will go through the church and bring holiness and purity, joy and power in the Western Church. And it will come as the prophets of Baal surround the prophets. The men, the gospel men, the men who were preaching the gospel, as the enemies surround them and look as if they're destroying them. God's coming! His power is coming for his preachers. Oh, hallelujah! Power is coming. Power is coming for the church. Great power. Great power of the Holy Spirit. Power that the church has not known for a long time. It happened in the 17th century. The church was more bound. People were drinking in the UK, a lot of alcohol and getting drunk, and people were not going to the Anglican Church. And the great Bishop Butler wrote his book, On Apologetics, The Analogy of Religion, and it was a mighty intellectual book, book to ten, stem the tide against ungodliness. But it didn't work because ungodliness rose, and the, the UK became more and more immoral, and the same in America. And then God raised up George Whitfield, a student at Oxford, who was the son of an innkeeper, who had to earn a living at Oxford by cleaning the shoes of his fellow Oxford students. God's fire of the Holy Spirit came to Whitfield. You go and read his diary and see what it's like. When you read his diary, Whitfield's diary, you're in another world, my friend. And the fire of God came upon Whitfield, and the fire burned in his heart, and he went out and preached to the people in the fields. 20,000 people would come to hear him every time he preached because the fire was burning hot in Whitfield. And then it happened to John Wesley and Charles Wesley. And it happened to Jonathan Edwards in America. And the fire burned and burned and burned and burned until skepticism was pushed aside. And a new cultural revolution took place in the UK and in America. And it is said that the French Revolution never came to the UK because of the Whitfield and Wesley revival. The fire of the Holy Spirit. The fire is real. There is a power. And that power of God is coming to the church. It's soon to come. God is soon to come to his church. And rescue her from the enemies of God. But you need to pray for this. And you need to be praying now. That God would come and send the fire. And he's coming. He's coming to the church. 
He's going to lift the church to a new plane. He's going to lift the church to a new vision. Because the Holy Spirit is going to move. In 1945, right, to maybe sorry 1950 right through the 1950s to 1959 Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preached about the importance of revival and he preached a long series go and listen to it on revival and he said pray that God would send his Holy Spirit and revival would come I believe those prayers are going to be answered I believe Lloyd-Jones and the people who prayed with him and those who he inspired to pray and many others have been praying those prayers are coming and they're all going to come in one big answer to prayer we're going to see a great revival in the West it's going to be unstoppable it's going to be mighty it's going to be powerful it's going to usher in a new revolution within the church but it won't be a false revival it won't be a revival whipped up by music or a revival whipped up by some personality or a revival whipped up by some mega church pastor. It will be a deep, powerful, abiding revival of the Holy Spirit of the living God. So pray. An example of what God can do is the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. The Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Only a few years ago, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary was a liberal seminary. But they appointed Dr. Al Muller there, who was a strong evangelical, and he knew the history of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He knew it was evangelical in its history. So what did he do? He sacked all the liberal theologians, sacked them, and he appointed evangelical theologians. And everybody in the culture and in America were up in arms against him, but he still went on and did it. And there were times when he and his, and his family had to stay in a front room because the press were outside filming what was going on. And some students who were boycotting him. But that seminary now is a powerful seminary for mission. Because Al Muller stepped out and was valiant for God. Luke chapter 1, 37. For with God nothing will be impossible. Do you believe that? Beloved, it is not our long prayers, but our believing It's our believing. Mark chapter 10, 27. But Jesus looked at them and said, With the men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. All things are possible. We see in this chapter, in 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter Thirteen, we see Abijah fighting. We saw, we see God standing with him. God has not changed. God is with him, and 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 heard his prayer as he cried out. And God will hear your prayer. He has not changed. He is going to answer. Our problem comes down to this. For Abijah, he believed in a great God. And he cried out to a great God, and a great God helped him. Our problem today is this. We have a small view of God. We're in unbelief. We don't believe in God. We don't believe in what he can do. And because we have small views of God, we are seeing little blessing in these days. A.W. Pink said, nothing is too great and nothing is too small to commit into the hands of the Lord. I'll read that again. Nothing is too great and nothing is too small to commit into the hands of the Lord. Hebrews 11, 6. 
but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And the old hymn says, Give me a faith which can remove and sink the mountains to a plain. Give me the childlike praying love which longs to build. Thy love let my heart O power and fill me from this very hour. Wow. We come to the end of that first part of our message in power in prayer. So we're going to have a break for a minute. And then perhaps we're going to go on and finish the rest of this message. So let's come before the Lord. Sorry. Oh God, we come before you today. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us a way forward. Lord, we see the enemy advancing on every side. And we see the church getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And, oh God, we come to you today and we confess our failure and sin. We confess our weakness. And we understand, Lord, it's not by might nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit, says the Lord. And we see that we can only fight to save men and women and boys and girls for you. Unless we have the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. We need the Holy Spirit just at the time in the book of Acts at Pentecost, in the times of the great revivals. We need that blessing of your Holy Spirit today. We can do nothing without you. We confess, Lord, our failure. We confess our backsliding. We confess our pride. We confess our sin. We confess we cannot do it, Lord. We cannot change people's hearts. We cannot change the situation. We can't do it, Lord. And we confess all these things. But we come to you today, Father, and we say, here we are. Forgive us, and we hand ourselves to you today. And Father, we ask that you might be pleased to bless us and send the fire of the Holy Spirit. We ask for the Holy Spirit to come and bless your church around the West and the world today and in the East. We pray for an outpouring of revival, for a great revival in the West today and in the East. And we pray that this would demonstrate your glory and it would scatter your enemies. So God, all your enemies think they have won. We pray that you would show them that you are on the throne. We ask these things, Lord, for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God is good. God is good. Let's see if we can find that. You'll like this if you enter a revival. I think somebody's listening. So anyhow, let's see. Okay, we, we'll uh, we'll just uh, have a look at this video. Uh, just for a minute, until I just have a rest for a second.
I got saved at 14, I'm 84, almost 85. So I've been 70 years, I've seen all kinds of tragedies in the church, and wars and rumors of wars, popular men gone popular and so forth. But keep looking up to Jesus and reading the word and remembering these old paths that my daddy used to talk about so much. And all the other looks like trivia. <laughs> I have often said that uh, I didn't come to Jesus as, as an old English hymn like we used to sing so often. I came to Jesus, I was weary and worn and sad. I didn't because I was 14 and uh, I didn't understand my father's zeal for God. I didn't come because I was convicted of sin. I came because of the blanks in my life, like he relished reading the word of God. And he relished going to prayer meetings, even the half nights of prayer. And also, more than ever, he relished being a street corner preacher. And that, uh, do you remember the hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, Thou Lamb of Calvary? Well, the last stanza says, May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart, my zeal inspire. And my dad had inspired zeal. God lifted the beggar from the dunghill, he completely changed my daddy, he'd been to a certain system of religion which made him fearful and uh, terrified of priestcraft and all that. And he got marvelously born again as a result of hearing uh, David Matthews, who went through the Welsh Revival, then he wrote the classic, it's still a classic, on I Saw the Welsh Revival. And my daddy had never been in meetings like that. And the fervor and the joy, uh, particularly I remember seeing David Matthews when I was five years of age. I'd never seen anybody preach like he sang like his mouth like an oval and he had a shock of black wavy hair and he had a zeal and he had a joy in the Lord that stirred and my daddy got saved. Well as a result of that as I say he became fervent in spirit serving the Lord. I never saw him downcast, I never saw him uh, suggesting about giving up but I mean when he got saved, he, he tossed away his interest in professional football and everything else, which, which of course became a, a style in England. After you're saved, you never go to a movie, you never go to a professional match, there's so much profanity and so forth. And when I saw that, and I saw the joy, and we lived in comparative poverty, we had much money, my daddy was a laborer. And as a result of that, as I say, at 14, he took me to a half night of prayer, there was three old men there and they prayed and my dad was a big husky man taking his coat off at one o'clock in the morning in a room that had no heat and praying with tears and fervor. From that very day I recognized there's something far beyond what the average Christian had. And then after that of course I went to the Methodist class meeting till I was 14 and that was full of the joy Lord and uh, I mean people spoke as though God lived with them all the time and he did. And there was that same kind of zeal there. I mean, even in those days, back in the 19, or to, uh, well, that'd be around 1912, just before World War One, even, uh, there was a half hour song singing before the Sunday night service, but they didn't sing choruses except choruses from hymns. Or they sang great hymns like And Can It Be and so forth. And he had men who would explode in a meeting when he was singing, and can it be that I should... My chains fell off, an old boy would jump, and the tears fell down his face. He'd strike it up at the end. There's a woman to the left of us. I used to watch her because her neck would go red, and then she'd suddenly burst with a hallelujah, you know. We talk about the joy of the Lord, I've never seen anything like it. Well, at that time, Samuel Chadwick was preaching in the... He had revival on the local level in Leeds, and of course, the conversation in our house, we have ever had a newspaper. There's no talk about films, of course, which were just coming out then. It was all about God and missionaries and so forth. Daddy told me to see Padgett World, who founded the Japan Rescue Mission. I was about uh, 12, I think. I heard C.T. Stubb give a lecture one morning. And uh, later saw Miss Cable and Miss Francesca French that walked through China and the Gobi Desert and all that kind of. My daddy, wherever there was a anything further, I'll tell you, at that <coughs> time,
So that's amazing, isn't it? Leonard Ravenhill, he's not, he, he was a minister not far from where I was uh, born and where I lived as a little boy at a Nazarene church not far from where I lived and he was a great leader and a great man of God. But you heard it there, it's a different world than today. All these watch night services and prayer, prayer time, and uh, but it's coming, the fire's coming. I'm going to put uh, Paul Washer on. And let's just hear him for a second. I'm really here. Every tree that does, at least in this city, believe themselves to be believers. If you go back to your hometown and knock on every door, because I went back to my hometown after I got saved and knocked on every door, and you know what I found out? Everyone in my town is a Christian. 85% of them do not go to church, and those who do go to church are not concerned about holiness. They're not concerned about serving. They're not concerned about being separate from the world. They're not concerned about the gospel being preached among the nations. But bless God, they're saved. Why are they saved? Because some evangelist who should have spent less time preaching and more time studying his Bible told them they were saved. And he did it so that he could brag about how many people came forward in his next revival. I love you. And there are men here who love you. And I want to go into Scripture now. Now that I've shocked you into life, I want you to listen to me. Isn't that amazing? What are you asked if you doubt your salvation? Did you pray a prayer one time? What does Scripture teach? Examine yourselves, test yourselves in the light of Scripture to see if you're in the faith, because a Christian will be different. Now, I'm, am I saying that a Christian is without sin? No, because in 1 John we learn that Christians do sin, and if any man does not acknowledge a sin, he knows not God. He's not walking in the light. So what is the difference? What am I really getting at? What am I getting at is this. If you are genuinely a born-again Christian, a child of God, you will walk in the way of righteousness as a style of life. And if you step off that path of righteousness, the Father will come for you. He will discipline you. He will put you back on that path. But if you profess to have gone through the narrow gate and yet you live in the broad way just like all the other people in your high school, just like all the other people who are carnal and wicked. The Bible wants you to know that you should be terribly, terribly afraid. But you know not God. The son was in our church and was martyred by the Muslims. In northern Nigeria, when someone professes faith in Jesus Christ, you pretty much know it's, it's true. Why? They can die because of that profession. But in America, oh, consider the cost. Think, examine your life in light of Scripture. Do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Because not everyone who says to Him, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But what does it say here? Look what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What is the sign that someone has become a genuine Christian? I wish that we would start teaching this again. What happened to our theology? What happened to our doctrine? What happened to our teaching? It went right out the window. No one wants to study doctrine anymore. They just want to listen to songs and read the back of Christian t-shirts. What happened to truth? Truth tells you this. The evidence, the way that you can have assurance that you are genuinely a born-again Christian is that you do, as a style of life, the will of the Father. You say, oh, you're talking about works. No, I'm not. I'm talking about evidence of faith. And it goes like this. Your profession of faith is no proof that you're born again because everybody in this whole country professes faith in Jesus Christ. Barnard tells us that 65 to 70 percent of all Americans are saved. Born-again Christians most godless country on the face of the earth. Kill 4,000 babies a day, a day, but bless God, 70% of us are born again. How do you know that that faith you have is not false? A style of life that is concerned about doing the will of the Father, that practices the will of the Father, and when you disobey the will of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes and reprimands you, either personally, through the written Word of God, through a brother or sister in Christ, and God puts you back on the path again. 
If you're a genuine Christian, you cannot escape him. Let me give you an example. If I was your pastor, and you were, let's say, 14 years old, and I came back from preaching at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I saw you standing out there in a park or on a corner with a bunch of hoodlums doing things you shouldn't be doing, and you were a member of our church, I would tell you, get in the car. I would take you home to your father. I wouldn't be mad at you. I'd be mad at your father. I would tell him, sir, you are a derelict father that you would allow your child to be out in such circumstances. I want you to know something. God is not a derelict father. If you can play around in sin, if you can love the world and love the things of the world, if you can always be involved in the world and doing things of the world, if your heroes are worldly people, if you want to look like them and act like them, if you practice the same things they practice, oh, my dear friend, listen to my voice. There's a good chance you know not God and you do not belong to him people in the Southern Baptist Convention, regardless of all our numbers, regardless of everything we say, if we were to simply take this passage and compare the people to this passage and say, are you building your marriage on the Word of God? Are you raising your children on the Word of God? Are you doing your finances on the Word of God? Are you living, separating yourself from the things of this world based upon the Word of God? How many would be able to answer positively? Go! God be with you. And if you die, my son, I'll see you over there and I'll honor your death. Oh, my God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, God. I don't care about reputation. I don't care what men think. I want you to be honored. I want, I want these young people to be saved. I want those that are saved to stop looking around them at a cultural Christianity that you hate and will spew out of your mouth and that they will look at the Word of God and say, I will follow Jesus. Oh God, I pray for youth ministers and pastors and I pray that you'd fill them with a spirit of wisdom and love and boldness and discernment. And dear God, whatever the cost, I pray that you would raise up missionaries. I can't help but look at these kids and think of my own little boy. Oh, God, that you would save Ian, and that you would raise him up and send him into the worst part of the battle. Oh, dear God, raise up missionaries here. Raise up missionaries. Raise up preachers and pastors and reachers and evangelists that know the Word of God. Oh, God, work in this place. Please work in this place, dear God. Please, please, please. Amen. Powerful, eh? Fires you up, inspires you. This is the kind of stuff we need, brothers and sisters. We need to be inspired. Run the race. It's no time to cool down. It's time to run. This is another good place to go. Sermon Index is a really, really good place to go. Welcome, especially to look at it in verse 25, beginning to read. I want to sprinkle clean water upon you. This is his new message. Ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? He had just been telling you, cleanse yourself. Clean yourself up. A new heart also will I give you. And new spirit will I put within you. He just told him, go get a new heart, go get a new spirit. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes 
and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Everything he's been commanding them to do, God comes along and says, by my spirit, I'll do it. Ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. Ye shall be my people and I'll be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the corn and, and increase it. No, lay no famine upon you. You will be in the covenant that you will know that you are secure in Christ. You're going to need that in the days ahead. But you see, the people say, well, how do I get into this covenant? How, how do I enter into a covenant? How can I enjoy this new covenant? There is something we've got to do. Listen to what is commanded of Ezekiel. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy. Verse 9. Prophesy to who? Now the word prophesy, there's preach. He said, preach to the wind. Who's the wind? The Holy Ghost. Preach to the Holy Ghost. Prophesy, son of man. Prophesy, son of man. And say to the Holy Ghost or the wind, Thus saith the Lord God. Hold the Holy Ghost to the covenant. Challenge the Holy Ghost to the covenant. Now, wait a minute. Does that sound a little blatant to you? You know, my Bible says, Come boldly to the throne of grace that you receive mercy and grace. Come bring forth your strong reasons. The Holy Ghost loves to be challenged by the covenant. Prophesy to the wind, prophesy with some man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, O Holy Ghost, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, he is commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Here stands before him now a great army, alive and breathing. The Holy Ghost is in his place. The Holy Ghost has taken possession. And now they stand in exceeding strong army before Ezekiel. He sees them there ready for battle. What happened? How did they get the Holy Ghost? How did they enter into the covenant? They're in the covenant now. They're in their strength. How did they, how did, why did the Spirit answer their call? What's the secret that the Holy Ghost is unveiling to the prophet and to us here? You see, Jesus said, your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. But there's a way to ask. It was not simply, Holy Ghost, come and fill us. Not at all. It was told the prophet, you say to the wind, and you say to the Spirit, and you preach to the Spirit, thus saith the Lord. You hold the Holy Ghost to the oath that the Father made. The Holy Ghost cannot do anything in you any more than Christ could do anything where there was unbelief. He can't do it where there's unbelief. The Holy Ghost can be in you and do absolutely nothing in the way of deliverance if there's unbelief. Oh... Over the years, I have ministered to so many multitudes, including pastors, godly people who love the Lord with all of their heart, who weep and cry over a failure in their life, whether it was pride, a covetousness, a fear of man, a lust, adultery, whatever it may be, something that had their heart and they cried for weeks. Some of them lived for years under the bondage. Spirit-filled, yes, spirit-filled, talking in tongues people who for years carried the battle and said, and, and as well as said, look, I know that the Holy Ghost abides in me, but I have not been able to see the release of power. If the Holy Ghost is in me, where is the power? Why do I not see the release of it? You say that he has the power, he can embolden me, and I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Where is the power? Why isn't it coming out? If there is an intensity against sin in your life, if there's an intensity in you to walk a holy and pure life, if there's an intensity in you against your besetting sin, and you say, God, I hate this sin, and I want victory, and there's an intensity in you 
to believe that the Holy Ghost is, is going to do what is fulfilled, then the Holy God himself is calling upon Ezekiel the prophet. He says, I am telling you, I am telling you to preach to the Holy Ghost to come and do what he's called to do. You take the Holy Ghost to the oath. Because the Holy Ghost was one of the makers of the covenant. He wants you to pray the covenant. In other words, pray it and believe it with everything in your heart. Amen. Amen. That's David Wilkinson. What a great guy. I love the guy. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Paul Washer, David Wilkerson, Leonard Ravenel, who the magnificent three. Hallelujah. This is what we need, brothers and sisters. Woo! Hallelujah. Sorry, I'm just encouraged to hear stuff like that. It just encourages your soul, doesn't it? Hey, it encourages you. We need it, brothers and sisters. Okay, let's turn to uh, two chronicles, uh, two chronicles, chapter thirteen. Let's pray for the next session in power, in prayer. I don't know what we're going to do here. I've not looked at my notes as much as I should have done. I knew the other sermon, this sermon. I'm just going to have to wing it, see what the Holy Spirit brings out for us in this part, okay? Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love. And, oh God, I pray that you bless this final message for your glory in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So let's see what God wants to say to us now. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 13, and we'll go to verse 18. Thus the men of Israel were subdued at that time, and the men of Judah prevailed because they relied on the Lord, the God of their fathers. They relied on the Lord, the God. Now, let's just recap what we've done. Basically, the whole problem in that first sermon is men and women have a small view of God. It says in the Bible, for with God all things are possible. And we need to believe that when we come to God in prayer. That God is the God of the impossible. And that's really what it all sums up. And that God will and is going to send the fire of the Holy Spirit down upon his church do you believe it it's no good saying it's impossible all things are possible let's believe that God is coming in revival power soon now let's turn to verse 14 uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 13 verse 14 it says Jeroboam had sent an ambush around to come upon them from behind, thus his troops were in front of Judah, and the ambush was behind them. And when Judah looked, behold, the battle was in front and behind, and they cried to his Lord, to the Lord, and the priests blew the trumpets. The enemies of God are very crafty, and they assess the situation. Those who were trying to take the nation of America have assessed the situation. The skeptics and those who are trying to take over the country of America have assessed the situation and they are crafty and they have maneuvered and they are maneuvering to take over that nation. It's the same in the UK. The enemies of God have maneuvered to take over the nation. And in your nation, the enemies of God are crafty. And just in the time of Judah, Jeroboam came and he was manipulating the people, uh, his armies and he was ready and crafty and surrounded Judah to take Judah. But God catches the enemies in their craftiness. Because at that point, the people of God will cry out and God will answer their prayer. And here it says, And when Judah looked, behold, the battle was in front and behind them, and they cried to the Lord, and the priest, priest blew the trumpets. And the priest blew the trumpets. Adam Clark said, Prayer requires more than heart than of tongue. Prayer requires more of the heart than of the tongue. When you're surrounded with your enemies, 
as they were, it came from the heart. That's what we need to do. We need to pray prayers from the heart. It needs to come gut-wrenching from the heart. Charles Finney, I don't agree with everything Finney says or did, but this is what he said. I have never known a person sweat blood, but I have known a person pray till the blood started from his nose, and I have known persons to pray till they were all wet with perspiration in the closet. Whether in winter, I have known persons to pray for hours till their strength was all exhausted with agony of their minds. Such prayer prevails with God. Now, I, I don't want to take sides on people who attack Charles Finney. I'm more on the Calvinistic side, so I don't want to get involved with that. I take that as a man sincerely knowing what he's talking about there. He's saying that he was in agony in prayer, that he's seen people in agony in prayer praying. That's the kind of prayers that we need if we're going to see God move against the enemies and if we're going to see revival, if we're going to see nations changed, that's the kind of prayer that we need to be doing. It's got to come from the heart. Do you care? Do you care? I'll ask you again, do you care? Do you care for the glory of God? David Wilkinson, Leonard Ravenhill, and Paul Washer care for the glory of God. How much do you care? Or I care for the glory of God. How much are we caring for the glory of God? If we care, why are we not pleading with God to bless? Why are we not pleading for God to bless his church, his people, with blessing so that the world can see that God is alive? We care for the glory of God. Why aren't we praying to him to bless us so that people can see the church is full of people who have been born again? Do we care for the lost? Do we care that the people who reject God will go to a lost eternity? Do we care, my friend? Luke chapter 23, 45, 46. Then the sun was darkened at the veil of the temple, was torn in two, and when Jesus had cried, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he said this, and he breathed his last. The Lord committed his spirit to the Father. It cost him to pray. It cost him everything how much does it cost you in prayer do you go into the closet and weep do we weep we pray prayers that don't cost us anything it don't cost us time it don't cost us sweat it don't cost us anything what does it cost us to pray as we pray we need to avoid the religion of man in verse 9 in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 Chronicles chapter 13 verse 9 he says have you not cast out the priests of the Lord the enemies of God were using man-made religion. We can't use man-made religion. We use revealed religion of the word of God. So many today in the church have made the church man-centered. It's all about business meetings. It's all about your clever ideas. It's all about your new theology. And it's all men's ideas. We mustn't rest on men's ideas. We must rest on the word of God. And we must rest on the power of the Holy Spirit. Too often we would rather have an evangelist who's famous, who's got loads of money, who can come in a jet and wear a big white suit and that impresses us rather than a man who is full of the Holy Spirit. What are we resting in, men's religion or God's? What are we resting in, men's ideas or God's power? 2 Chronicles chapter 12 verse 1, Now it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened them himself, that he forsook the Lord of the Lord and all Israel along with him. There are many that are enemies of God that will corrupt the church, will corrupt the church with bad teaching, corrupt the church with false teaching. And we mustn't go along with them. We mustn't side with them. We must side with those who want to pray for revival and the work of God. 2 Chronicles chapter 12 verse 5 Then Shemir the prophet came to Roboam and the leaders of Judah who were gathered together in Jerusalem because Shizak had said to them Thus says the Lord you have forsaken me and therefore I also have left you in the hand of Shizak. My friends the reason why many in the church today 
are not being blessed is because they follow man's religion and God leaves them and he judges them I give you an example here's a terrible example of man's religion there is not far from where I used to live in Presswich is a Jewish area and in that Jewish area there was a big old congregational church that was derelict now that big old church and it's a very very big church in 1910 1920 or I think right about 1910 was the home church of one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century P.T. Forsyth now P.T. Forsyth did theology but a lot of the theology he did he mixed it with philosophy pretending that it was based on the Bible but it was actually philosophy rooted in the Bible and what is the fruit of his ministry today that great big church is no longer derelict it is now a block of flats that is what happens to man's religion man's religion will be shown to be false okay 12 verse 7 now when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves the word of the Lord came to Shamia saying they have humbled themselves therefore I will not destroy them but I will grant them some deliverance and here's the problem why we're not getting blessed is because of pride here the people of God humbled themselves and God then was willing to answer their prayer but the reason why we're not getting blessing in the church is because of our pride we are proud that we give our minister a good salary we are proud that we have a good building we are proud of our theology we are proud of our achievements we are proud of ideas proud of our trendy ideas proud of our new thinking our new understanding and all the rest of it people are proud because they are proud God will not bless God will not send his Holy Spirit a lot of the theological seminaries of sending little demons into church these pastors that are coming into church are not ministers of the word they are little demons full of pride full of their new ideas new fangled ideas of theology books that they've read from some trendy professor who's never pastored a church in their life and so these pastors go from the seminaries into the churches and they are not pastors of the word they are little demons full of pride creating more little demons full of pride and until the church humbles itself and bows the knee and says Lord we cannot change our situation unless you come we will never see blessing we have to humble ourselves and the church has been too proud for a long time if you turn to 2 Chronicles 26 verse 16 to 23 it says uh, you, in about Uzziah but when he was strong his heart was lifted up to his destruction for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense there a leader of God became proud pride God hates pride there are many people today who are in leadership full of pride brimming with pride there is a revival in orthodox theology but it is not blessed with the fire of the Holy Spirit because it is mixed with pride these theologian little Calvinist theologians in the churches the young men who have got a, a whiff of the Puritans walk around with theological pride and there is no blessing of the Holy Spirit that the people who are proud that they have the fivefold ministry the gift of the Holy Spirit here and the gift of this and the gift of that and they are full of pride and God will not bless those who are proud there are ministers today who think that they are solidly evangelical but they are proud of their orthodoxy there are ministers today who are more emergent church and they think that they are not as small minded and they are proud of their cultural savviness but pride God hates there are ministers today who are in charge of big mega churches and they are proud of their fame pride means that God is not going to bless and pride is the thing that will stop us from being blessed and we have to come in prayer and humble ourselves and say Lord forgive me for my pride
Pride is a great problem in the church today. And then, if we're going to see God's blessing, we need to be obedient. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, it says, 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to his sight. If we're going to see power in prayer, we have to be obedient to the light that we have. In John chapter 15, verse 9, it says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. Sorry. God, Lord says, if you're obedient, he will answer. A. Tori says, I put the same question to each of you. Are you studying the word of God every day of your life to find out what the will of God is? Are you studying it? Are you trying to find out the word of God? Are you trying to get into the things of God and obey it? D.L. Moody came to England, and as he was as he was organizing uh, evangelistic meetings, there would be elderly ladies praying for his ministry, and he was blessed powerfully when he came to England. In Acts chapter fourteen thirty one, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. If we're obedient and we pray. God is going to bless in a mighty way. So we've come to the conclusion. We've come to the end of this study in, in power in prayer. And here's, here's where it comes. 2 Chronicles chapter 17 verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways Excuse me. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The church of the evangelical church in the West today is in a mess. It's in an absolute mess. It's in a mess. There's no doubt about it. It's in a mess. And this is where we have to start. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. We have to humble ourselves and pray. We have to start seeking his face and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. We've got to turn from sin. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. E.B. Pussy said, practice in life whatever you pray for and God will give it to you more abundantly. The hymn says, Now thank we all our God, with hearts and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done, in whom this his world rejoice, this world rejoices, who for our mother's arms he blessed us on our way, the countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Let's pray. Let's pray that God will bless his church. The fire of the Holy Spirit is coming. But it starts with us humbling ourselves. Seeking his face passionately. Are we going to do that? Are we going to start suing God? Seeking him. Passionately seeking him. That's what I've been challenged to do right now. Is to seek him passionately. Fervently to bless with his Holy Spirit upon the church. That's what we need to do. Let's come before the Lord. Oh God, we come to you today and we're conscious of the need of the fire of the Holy Spirit. We're conscious, Lord, we're not breaking through, that the masses are not coming to you. We're conscious, Lord, that we're losing the battle. We see a bit of blessing, Lord. But we need a revival. We need great blessing. We need you to work in a powerful way. So God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will bless. That you will bless for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Stir us up to pray, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. I hope you've been blessed by this.
and uh, take care and see you soon. I don't know if I'll do another pa uh, and some more talks or not. Uh, I think I might call it a day. We'll see how God leads. But I'm very tired after doing those two messages on prayer. So thank you for listening and take care.